Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we'll be exploring the life and work of the great science fiction writer Philip K. Dick, whom some regard as a great visionary prophet and mystic, while others believe that it's a sad case of mental illness. My guest today is my good friend James Tunney, an Irish barrister, an artist, a poet, a scholar. He is the author of The Mystical Accord, Sutras to Suit Our Times, Lines for Spiritual Evolution. The Mystery of the Trapped Light, Mystical Thoughts in the Dark Age of Scientism, Empire of Scientism, The Dispiriting Conspiracy and Inevitable Tyranny of Scientocracy, Tech Bondage, Slavery of the Human Spirit, and most recently, Human Entrance to Transhumanism, Machine Merger and the End of Humanity. He's also written two dystopian novels, Blue Lies September and Ireland, I Don't Recognize Who She Is. James lives in Gothenburg, Sweden. And now I'll switch over to the internet video. Welcome, James. What a pleasure yet again to be with you. Great to see you, Jeff, and congratulations on winning the Bigelow Prize. We were the, all delighted for you, so well done. Thank you. So today we're going to be talking about Philip K. Dick, uh, who is, I think, as much of an enigma and a controversial figure as our last interview about the artist Francis Bacon. I imagine that in their own worlds, they're uh, about of equivalent fame. They're they're both very close to the top of their profession, and and yet in the case of Philip Dick, uh, there are many critics who regard him. As as a classic case of mental illness. As with all, nearly all the figures that, we, we, that are interesting that we've looked at, particularly in the mystic context, the allegation of madness is there. And certainly uh, there's a, a book, The Divine Madness of, of Philip K. Dick, which uh, talks about his amphetamine psychosis, which is, there's no doubt about his use of amphetamines and certain drugs so when we're getting into substance abuse there's certainly it's certainly easier to present the case but beyond that we have the usual suspects which are trotted out like temporal lobe epilepsy and uh, migraine and all these and and sometimes they're useful but in most cases for me they begin to obscure the picture and in the end you have to still look at the product at the fruit of the of the spirit, if you like, of the work, and that withstands any any attack, and so it it there is a a a dominant force which transcends any of those medical uh, explanation. Now, certainly, he did take drugs. He didn't take psychedel uh, psychedelics in the way that people believe. He took it a, a, a two or three times. A lot of people overestimate the his his use of psychedelics. They didn't really agree with him. So he uses amphetamines to help him write more. So it's not necessarily that his visions are coming from, from, from these drugs. In relation to the madness, there was certainly a degree of paranoia. And he did, uh, in Canada, uh, attempt to commit suicide. So he, had, he was seriously disturbed in some, some, uh, some ways. There's no question about that. We can't necessarily ignore that. But we cannot extrapolate from there and, uh, and, and therefore dismiss his mystic visions, uh, which fit the classic pattern, or disregard his work, which stands on its own two feet. And in the context of looking at the evidence, we have to bear in mind that other people or people that were around can have their say now. He's gone. He can't put his, his side. So I think we have to have a benign interpretation of, of the, the full extent of the evidence. I guess it's useful just to lay out 
his his body of work briefly. I think there have been well over a dozen films made of his science fiction stories and novels. And uh, I don't know how many short stories he's written, but I believe the, the number of novels is something like 44. Uh, yes. Uh, so he, he's done that amount of, of novels. And he's known for science fiction novels, but he also did realist novels as well, set in California in areas that you're very familiar with. They haven't be, they weren't as popular. Uh, as he, he did over 120 short stories, a lot of them very significant, and some of those are, have been translated in films. For me, his greatest work is the work that he, he didn't set out to publish. The exegesis of Philip K. Dick represents a, a collection an edited collection of thoughts that he had after his major mystical experience, which represent the, an amazing speculation on the nature of reality. So he, he did write articles as well, in the, independently of his, his fictional work, interesting articles about the nature of androids and the nature of man and the nature of reality, or, or ma men and women. Um, so his, of course... He's, he will be known in relation to his films, uh, the uh, Total Recall, Minority Report, and, and the, the, the Blade Runner, of course. A Scanner Darkly is another uh, uh, film about 14 years ago. And a number of smaller little films, or a whole range of films, actually, that have been adapted in various ways. And uh, also in other major films, if we, if we begin to think of films that that weren't his ideas, but his ideas were reflected in them in, in many ways, like uh, The Matrix or even The True Man Show. The same ideas are, are moving around in the sci-fi uh, literature community that informed the uh, film production. So he has certainly presented a view of the future, of a dystopian future in many senses. But in that context, he's used it as a vehicle for de very deep philosophical and theological issues. One of the main themes that seems to run through many of his novels and stories is the idea that the reality that we believe we are living in is something of an illusion, that things are not what they appear to be. Yes, this is, this is this, the two central ideas was that idea, exactly as you have expressed it, that reality is not what it seems to be, and we have to be careful. And secondly, associated with that is that human reality is not what it seems to be. Our psychic or, or psychological interpretation of the world is not uh, what it seems to be. And having lived in, in Berkeley for the formative years of his life, it's in a place called Berkeley, it's not a, a surprise perhaps to, be, to have such views. Uh, and associated with those ideas was a... a uh, an anticipation of the future, whereby it would be difficult for us to distinguish between uh, machine forms of humans, androids, and humans themselves. And that was a profound philosophical issue, which brings us to issues of the nature of humanity and what distinguishes us from humans. And that was, that was of course, explored in Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep, which was the basis of Blade Runner. That is, it becomes difficult and you needed tests to, but even those tests could misrepresent the reality. So uh, that, that issue of what is reality is important, but there are a range of interpretations as to what he means by his questioning of the assumptions of reality. And in that context, there's room for debate in relation to where he was coming from in that context. Well, I can say, having lived in Berkeley and having been a student at Berkeley for 10 years, from 1970 to 1980, which was a, a time, I guess, when P.K. Dick was also in Berkeley and in the Bay Area, that it was a very intense intellectual activity. And questioning the nature of reality was going on everywhere at, at that time, at least in my world. In fact, my Dissertation advisor at Berkeley, Michael Scriven, a philosopher, wrote articles uh, about that very issue, about uh, what does it mean to be a robot uh, and how do robots differ from humans? Uh, that's something that philosophers were grappling with. Well, he only went, he went to Berkeley, attended Berkeley 
having lived there from the time he was a child. He was born in Chicago, and he, he, apart from living in Washington for a few years, he spent most of his life in California, and his formative years were in Berkeley. So he certainly he, he breathed in the atmosphere there. And although he only went to Berkeley for a short period of time and made to major in philosophy for a year, he used his Berkeley library card and he read very extensively. So that reading in the Berkeley library was important and he probably learned more than he would have in any university course. So he read everything. He was very interested in James Joyce, for example, as a lot of the countercultural people were, as uh, Joseph Campbell uh, was, Terence McKenna, Timothy Leary. They were very interested in Joyce. Joyce is underestimated in some of these discussions. And he, uh, Philip K. Dick, or one of his characters, says that he knew the streets of Dublin better than the streets of Berkeley from ha having read uh, James Joyce. So in that context, he did expose himself to those ideas, those ideas that were emerging in science, for example, in relation to the, the split brain, for example. And in his exegesis, there are a number of your friends that, that come up, or a number of references. There's reference to the work of Ornstein, who you're, you were talking about uh, recently, uh, and a range of people that you have interviewed. I think Rollo May comes up. So he was in that milieu. He was, he was involved in all those uh, interesting um, storm of ideas about the nature of reality, about science, and also aware, of course, of the political nature of reality. And, uh, of course, the, he was particularly interested in the Nixon administration. It's a bit, it's a bit ironic that Philip K. Dick had Irish connections uh, in, in his background, and a, a Quaker background. So uh, he, he starts off as a, from a kind of Quaker background and later becomes Episcopalian. And uh, Richard Nixon as well came from, uh, had an Irish Quaker background <laughs> as well. So it's interesting, two very different, different routes. But in that context, for people that are not very familiar with the period, there was an air of paranoia coming from the government. I mean, people talk about, about conspiracies and conspiracy theories, but it's often as with the same phenomenon as in relation to Blake, that conspiracies and, and fear and uh, come from, from the administration's themselves. So we had COINTELPRO associated with the FBI, the MK Ultra uh, saga, the, uh, the experimentation with drugs, with truth serums. We had had the Manchurian candidate, we had the assassination. So, I mean, it's a very fraught time. And of course, the, the, the war in Vietnam and the military industrial complex is close by. So he was also, again, it's the same as with Blake, he's accused of being anxious. He was anxious. But if you are anyway, in tune with these events, and especially if you are psychic or tuned into the, 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 the context, well, you're going to be paranoid. And there's a famous, in November 1971, November 17th, 1971, his safe is, it was attacked when he was living in Marion County, and he believed it was the FBI. But uh, it's, it's not, uh, now most people, some people believe he did it himself, or it was associated with drugs. But the idea that it could be the FBI or CIA is certainly not inconsistent with the range of activities that were happening at the time. So it's certainly a very plausible scenario. So that, that air of paranoia was there as well as all that exploration, and it informed his views very much. I'm fascinated by the fact that he seemed to take a an intellectual interest in his own mental health. And that's why he wrote about Ornstein and, and Rollo May. He was looking deeply at uh, psychiatry itself and uh, research and consciousness so that he could understand uh, what he himself was going through. Well, the, you had a very interesting discussion recently about ecstasy. And as far as I know, the, the origin of the word ecstasy refers to the ability to stand outside yourself. So this is, a, and that distance, you've talked about it recently. And in a recent talk uh, with uh, Mr. Spina, you've talked about this, uh, this idea as well of coming outside. And it's very, very interesting. And actually a connection between the, when I listen to that talk, and when I think of Philip K. Dick, one connection is uh, goes back to the unforgot or the, the largely forgotten Benjamin Blood, who wrote in 1874 a pamphlet 
called the uh, anesthetic Revel revelation and the gist of philosophy now this influenced william james who knew of the work of this mystic poet and he, his uh, his uh, understanding was or his revelation was that when a person is coming out of an anesthetic state that their consciousness having been suppressed can experience or can be experienced in a way that it can't be uh, on other occasions so we used to go around and talk to dentists and people that administered nitrous oxide and and talk to them and he found that this was a recurrent phenomenon and if you, in relation to philip k dick's experiences two of them at least seem to be when he is coming out of a, a, a having slept or having been subject to uh, administration of of of, of anesthetics um, which is forgotten about and but the point being about experiencing of your consciousness was something he was very aware of and he studied he studied it in the way that a philosopher would would look at it so he could be very uh, objective now he had studied philosophy so he's very familiar with the concepts and despite all the the idea that he's he's a drug addled madman who uh, is crazy uh, doesn't is not inconsistent with the degree of exploration and another context which I think we should bear in mind is if you look at the ex exegesis of, of Philip K. Dick uh, you, you read one page and he gives an explanation and the next page there's another explanation and then there's a, a contrary explanation so what he does is consistent with pragmatism and William James is he looks at the full extent of possible explanations now people says people think that that's not meaningful and that there's something wrong with that but uh, that's all for me is consistent with intelligence it's consistent with your discussions about semantics that you have to be able to interpret reality in a, in a whole w w wide range of ways and don't have closure if, you, if you're not exactly sure what the answer is so he was very objective he was capable of standing up but he knew that he was in the tradition of mystics he was in the tradition going back to burma and i i would argue also he was in the tradition of biblical prophets in a way he, he's going back to an idea of prophecy uh, because he never people emphasize his his connections with computer simulation etc but he never uh, really gave up on his connection with god the idea of god and he, he said it wasn't a belief that he knew it he, he knew god so that connection cannot be obscured and perhaps it goes back to his quaker is Quaker background the idea of a close connection with the light? Um, so, yeah, he, he is very objective in 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 my uh, my books about the examination of his experience, as objective as anyone can be. And certainly, if we're talking about ineffable experience, we know that there's limitations to what we can say. But the exploration is very important. I have read one. I don't even think it's a criticism, but maybe a uh, a reflection. Uh, one writer suggested that he took so many amphetamines that he was sleep deprived. And as a result of that, he, he was spending much of his day in the hypnagogic state, similar to that uh, experience by people coming out of deep sleep or coming out of an anesthetic. Yes, but if you come up with truth, it doesn't, it doesn't matter where it comes from, if it's true, if it's capable of being true or insight uh, if if it is insightful, if it if it presents an issue uh, which has a proposition, a hypothesis, a statement which is capable of, of examination by in more rational context, it can't it can't be dismissed. And again, if we go back to say Ezekiel in in Babylon, his behaviour was was very very strange. Uh, Swedenborg, any any of the mystics, their behaviour. Uh, is strange there is a great desire among materialists to find a physiological uh, or, or substantive uh, explanation for his behavior because you have to remember in relation to the admirers of philip k dick there's two different well there, there are different emphasis and he he said for example that he was a lot of his friends who were early on who were marxists didn't like any discussion later on when he's beginning to talk about mystical experiences because of course with their view of the world 
either in kind of materialist view and dialectic materialism. They're not really interested in any of this stuff about parapsychology, about spirits, about, about mystical experience. And therefore, they enjoyed his, uh, his, his work, which seems to be consistent with a, a certain deconstructive uh, attack on Western civilization. But when it was presented in terms of a classic, if you like, Judeo-Christian or perennial philosophy a stream, they didn't particularly like that, and he was aware of that. So it's very interesting that you can have two different groups of people who admire Philip K. Dick, but for completely opposite reasons. He is, uh, there's a battle going on, if you like, for the soul of Philip K. Dick, not only for his head that went missing apparently on an android there, or some, some mechanical representation they created of him, but there's a battle going on. Some people say Philip K. Dick represents our desire to have a transhumanist future where we can simulate reality and proves that the world is a simulation. And some others who, who say, well, this is a, a mystical man who is engaged in a deep inner exploration and that enabled him to look at all cultures, to have respect not just for, for Christianity, but for Buddhism and Taoism. And therefore, he's a representative of the perennial philosophy tradition, which, which is the tradition I would put him in. Just to go back briefly to the remark I made about the hypnagogic state, I certainly didn't mean it in a disparaging way, and I'm, I don't think the writer that I'm citing meant it that way either, even if it was drug-induced. Uh, the hypnagogic state seems to be a very elusive and rare state of consciousness. I know the esoteric historian Gary Lockman, whom I interviewed about Swedenborg and about Carl Jung, felt that they both both were gifted in being able to maintain a sustained hypnagogic state, and, and that accounted for the uh, wondrous visionary experiences that they were able to report. Yes, and with Philip K. Dick, I would emphasize the hypnopompic state, which is the state, of course, as you know, waking up. And this is a very a different state, because in many ways it's more difficult to capture. And it is one where you can encounter uh, like on a beach you wake up on a beach and you find something there which is washed up but it disappears very very quickly uh, many artists find that they have a concept they have a, a word they have an idea just at the stage when they wake up but one has to to capture it quickly before it disappears and he seems to be in that hypno hypnopompic uh, context as well and that's 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 where I think the association with the anesthetics, which, of course, as Benjamin Blood anticipated, would ex would be consistent with f or subsequent explanations of the default mode network. And I believe, in a, on a, a separate point, that uh, the study of the mystery religions uh, it would be better to look back at the possible administration of substances which acted as an anesthetic, whereby they dramatize the waking state at the, on the hypno, hypnopompic uh, state in the process uh, uh, in the mysteries and not psychedelic uh, experiences because uh, the person would not have the same contact with their own consciousness as was explained in, in your in your recent uh, interviews well i might also mention parenthetically uh, in the future uh, I expect to be able to interview Brian Muir Rescue, the author of a book called The Key to Immortality, in which he builds a very cogent case that the uh, ancient Greek Eleusinian mysteries and e even earlier mystery traditions were based on psychedelics. But we'll, we'll come back to that discussion in, uh, at, at a later time. For now, I think it's useful to to emphasize for the benefit of our viewers who may not have watched the 20 or so interviews that we've already done, that you in particular are very concerned about the rise of scientism and the potential for totalitarian societies to make use of science and technology to control the population in adverse ways. And I, I noticed that there's a very similar motif running through P.K. Dick. Yeah. I didn't copy him, Jeff. <laughs> but, uh, yes, there is. And I, I came at that 
through uh, my own historical uh, study, my interest in Philip K. Dick was as a mystic. Uh, I had read science fiction when I was a, a boy, and I'd, I'd read everything by Arthur C. Clarke. Well, I probably said it to you before. When I came to the point where he explained that the future of evolution was about merger of man and machine, I said, this is, this is something else. This is an ideology. I didn't use the word then, but I, I knew that it was something else. It didn't, it didn't fit. And uh, Arthur C. Clarke was ideological. He, was, he fit into that uh, imperial view that I, I would associate with the empire of scientism uh, with J.D. Bernal and Huxley. So they were telling you about a policy in the future. So, of course, he, he was right in relation to his predictions. And it's easier to be a bit right when you're, you're reading the, from the plan itself and from, uh, uh, from, from the, the blueprint. So I, I was interested in particular in the descriptions of Philip K. Dick's uh, experiences on, in February and March, the 2374 experiences in particular, and the beam of light and then his experience of light. And uh, that was something that I was particularly interested in. So as a result of that, I read his work um, uh, because of that interest in mysticism. But it's he, apart from his work, in his own statements, independently of that, he said that he was, a ver he was very afraid of the rise of totalitarianism in the United States and not just associate with technology. He said it, it, it will be in a different form or it could be in any form. It could be in a form you didn't expect. He said it could be. Now, he had come from a socialist and even a Marxist background there. He moved into, uh, I suppose, some uh, socialism, uh, I suppose, or a mild or what, what would be social democratic things or, or somewhere else uh, on the spectrum. Uh, but he thought, for example, that could be left fascism in, in the United States. He, put, he posed a range of things. But, but essentially, I think he's talking about variants of materialism and in that milieu, he, he, he emphasized the role of corporations, that corporations would be powerful. So we have big cartels running the world in a number of the novels. Uh, and there's always a big corporation involved in it. For example, the corporation that transports you a, for 18 years to live on, a, on another planet uh, it, you know, is a bad actor because... They have lovely pictures of what the planet is like, but they're fake, you know, so this, this, this is important. So he, he, he argues that the corporations can change reality, as can government. And when the two of them begin to act together, they can create the conditions for totalitarianism. But in my, it's deeper than what he has just said, because he has anticipated the nature of totalitarianism in the future. If you look at, for example, Gunter Anders, he, he, he realizes that a technology can lead to totalitarianism. But in relation to the exact specific way that it can happen, Philip K. Dick seems to come close to the mark. He argues that reality as we perceive it now can be manipulated so we we cannot tell what is real and what is not and people are getting concerned not just about aug uh, uh, virtual reality but also augmented reality so for example if we will we, we'll be forced we know more and more to use technology so that we will enter into virtual spaces that will be sold to us but we will be forced to do so they're forcing kids to do so for school for work whatever for whatever reasons we will be forced into various mutations of the metaverse or whatever you want to call it and then uh that's one that's one virtual reality context, collective virtual reality, but also augmented reality. When you walk into down the street in your town, that there can be projections on the, on the landscape which distort your perception of reality. So perception itself can be made unclean, if you like. It can be made, it can be compromised. So having unclean water, unclean air. We can also have an unclean perceptual environment where we cannot trust what we see. And this is, this is happening. And in fact, there are artists who have used the ideas from Blade Runner and Do Android's Dream of, of Electric Sheep to have projections onto buildings like the, the Guggenheim and Bilbao, I think. And you can, you can see that very soon, uh, digitally, 
people will, or authorities, corporations, will be able to change the reality that we perceive. And if we're talking about a context where we have a concentration of converged economic commercial power, our ability to interpret external reality will be severely compromised. And this is the great prophecy that he is telling us about. And this is the thing for me that the religious leaders, the theologians, have failed to anticipate. They have failed to adequately uh, anticipate how significant this alteration is. And in that sense, for me, uh, Philip K. Dick is a prophet in the old sense. He, he does realize what's going to happen. And remember as well, Ezekiel uh, has his visions, his mystical visions, and, and Ezekiel is also the basis of a form of, of mysticism in Judaism associated with the Merkaba and that which is very, very significant. So the, the idea, and, and also Ezekiel was a priest, uh, a, a Judaic priest that, that was realizing there was something wrong with the system that he was he was involved in. So uh, I, I think I, I do have a lot of, of correspondence with his views. And the other idea which which I share with him, uh, he expresses it in terms of the empire never ended. Uh, and I have a sim similar view. I, uh, I, I would argue, and, and what I think he's suggesting is that there is a uh, evolution of imperial structures that serve to create a hierarchical structure that end up oppressing people and, and destroying the environment. And that transmutes over, over time, that the empire moves on from one form to another. But it doesn't go away. So the British Empire never went away, for example. Uh, it, it, and, and in many senses, you could you can, could trace the British Empire back to the the, the, the Romans, etc. So in the sense that the empire doesn't go away, what form is the empire going to take? Now, I, I've, I've stated my belief that I think the empire of scientism has happened as a description uh, of, you know, how the, where the world is going to now as a, a scient scientocratic or technocratic form uh, of governance. Now, I, I, I know that, that that's difficult for a lot of people to, to accept, but it's, it's a, a serious consideration, I think, that people should bear in mind and bear in mind the dangers uh, or, or how our world is going to be changed when this technology comes on stream. Well, I guess the issue for many people is the ability to make very subtle discriminations and discernment, say, with regard to technology. Obviously, a lot of technology is helpful and beneficial. The human lifespan has increased, for example, as a result of technology, but much of it is harmful. And when you talk about projecting images I was reminded of our previous discussion of William Blake, in which uh, we showed our viewers the image of Blake's figure, your reason or your horizon, uh, projected onto St. Paul's Cathedral. And I think at the time you remarked that perhaps the theologians who were involved in approving that didn't realize the implications of uh, that figure, uh, your reason. I'm sure the lovely people that did that and they're not intending any, anything by, uh, by that. Um, and, but, and there's different interpretations. There could be a defense. But imagine, imagine, for example, in the future when some other group comes to attack the Capitol in Washington, for example. Uh, it will be m easier to make it disappear, to make it difficult to interpret where it is by projection. If you look back at the type of camouflage that was used in the First World War called the Razzle Dazzle, which makes it difficult to see on a broad scale that they used on, on certain warships, uh, this will be projected on environment, uh, environments to turn it into something else. Uh, I remember when the Queen came to the university and before the Queen comes, they always come around or the, whoever is receiving her painting things to make it look nice so she must think everything <laughs> smells of fresh paint and uh, i met the crown princess up here uh, a very nice woman in in, in sweden uh, they didn't bother that much about her when she was going around she experienced the same context uh, as everyone else but we we can, our, our experience of the environment can uh, depend on context and when this technology comes on stream uh, it can be used for good purposes and it can be used for bad purposes. Yes, of course, we know all about the 
we know all about the the benefits that you can you know your your Janelle can ring you and tell you that you forgot to put something in the fridge or whatever we know all about those benefits of technology and all that but if you look at network effects the good the good bit comes up front come along Jeffrey join up oh it's great look at the advantages you get this then begins to create that network effects which very very soon creates a momentum snowball effects exponential growth which gives power to people who control the platform when they get so strong and they accumulate commercial power which they can use to capture political power then they can begin to impose or utilize platforms to be imposed in social context and uh, utilize uh, corporate power beyond control and in that context then the technologies can be used to distort reality and they might be motivated by notionally good uh, ideas in the minds of the people that are doing it but i'm very concerned about this movement into the technosphere the movement away from reality the movement away from nature uh, and the the associate cost of these systems because they don't tell you about how costly these systems are on the environment and the direct uh, impact on on the biosphere so philip k dick uh, certainly identified these issues and he identified that these issues were issues which required us to explain ourselves to look inside so he wasn't obsessed with the technology he didn't see it as a technological issue he saw it as an issue about who we are and in that he emphasized the consciousness of the individual and the superior consciousness of the individual in my view and that's why he sought to look back at all the great explorations philosophically uh, from uh, plato and platonism neoplatonism and going back as well to akhenaten in, in, in egypt and his his idea uh, or the, what we know about light and also going back to the, the Gnostic text, and, and he was trying to assimilate a whole range of views to present us with an alternative view. And an important point that we should have, have or I could have mentioned earlier on, was that a defining issue for him was the death of his twin sister Jane a few weeks after uh, uh, they were born. And as a result of that, he had a sense of loss and a sense of there was something else missing perhaps and, and that was a spirit that was communicating to him there was a there was a sense of, of of something missing and associated with that was his interest in what is false and what is true this is the key issue that that is a very relevant issue now how you distinguish between falsehood and reality and therefore he wrote books like the uh, the simulacra uh, and and uh, we can build it for you where he's talking about or we can uh, he's talking about the idea for example that the united states might have an android president you know now some people might think that's a useful addition but that that's that's another 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 story but his idea of the simulacrum was very very influential on the on the french postmodernist it was he's a ser he was regarded seriously by uh, philosophers and that idea of uh, comes back to uh, context of what is a human and what if we have a a second person that looks like a human and how can we distinguish them he also emphasized you talked about uh, gary lockman who 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 talk who who talks and wrote about colin wilson and uh, in colin and, and you've talked to to both of them and colin wilson talks about the the robot within inside us and this idea that there's something uh, automatic that can take over from our autonomy in a certain case and th this is the same idea that philip k dick has he talks about he says that humans can be a androids as they are they can act like androids and this idea that technology is also turning us without mechanizing us is turning us into automatic beings to interact with us is another one that it's it's moving away from it's making us move away from feelings it's managing us that we're not making decisions we're not recognizing our own consciousness which pre-exists all these things and and uh, he was also interested as well in 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 of course in, in parapsychology and in the literature in parapsychology and in uh, spiritualism as well.
I'm particularly interested in the movie Minority Report as a parapsychologist, the idea that one could use precognition to determine in advance when crimes would be committed so the police can be right there on the scene to make arrests, uh, to me seems like a fascinating prospect worth exploring because uh, it, it's not implausible. I think it's, it's realistically possible. The problem is, Jeff, that uh, there's plenty of crime happening and uh, there's, a lot, there's, there's a lot of things that could be done about it, but people don't seem to be interested in it. In relation to uh, pre-cog and, uh, and pre-crime, there is predictive policing which does that technologically. Uh, and and that, that might be a bit of a danger when they knock on your door and they say, Jeff, we believe the computer has told us that you're going to commit a crime. No, it's out of character. You haven't done anything yet. But it's, it's you know, so, so that's the, the, the danger. Or you've written something or a series of talks and the computer says something or the algorithm says. So we have to, to question you about that. That's, that's the greater danger. Um, in relation to uh, precognition, there are a number of, 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 of contexts where this idea, he uses this idea of utilizing precognition, but he also anticipates in the minority report in the book, that there can be different timelines and different things can affect. And he also, I suppose, implies the idea from quantum physics that the observer can influence the outcome as well. So it's not uh, as easy uh, uh, as that, or it creates as many difficulties. So um, he, he, he was also interested and he did, he did apparently attend seances with Bishop Pike, who you've talked about uh, as well. So he was interested in a whole range of parapsychological uh, experiences. Well, with regard to parapsychology, uh, and in this sense, it's probably true of all technologies, there's the impulse to say, hey, this might really work. We've got to find out whether it will work or not. And then there's another impulse, which is, well, if it does work, it could be very dangerous and potentially highly unethical. I only know of one case in the history of parapsychology where a researcher actually was getting results that were so good. Uh, it frightened him and he stopped the research. He said, this is too dangerous. We don't want to go any further with it. And, and that had to do with the use of psychokinesis to m manipulate the uh, genetic structure of fruit flies. But uh, to think that you can manipulate the genes of another living creature through your own thoughts presents incredible nightmarish prospects. This does raise the issue of what is parapsychology for? And uh, there's obviously different emphasis in it. For, uh, for me, the benefit of parapsychology is to indicate the range of human potential uh, and to uh, corroborate uh, the, the fact that we are more than, than we seem to be. So in that sense, I see it as anti-reductionist and consistent with a wider view of, of the of the individual and it's doing the job in many senses that the relig religions have ceased to do in some senses because they don't emphasize some of the, the big issues uh, that are relevant to people's uh, to people's lives uh, the the problem of course is it, it, it can be misused but as against that there is a sense that at times of crisis and at times of trauma that's exactly when you need the people that have deep sense of connection with consciousness, deep experience of mysticism or of alternative realities, it's at that stage that, that those people can begin to represent what they see as the correction or the problem. And in that sense, uh, of course, these things can be taken over. And I'm, I'm very... Uh, skeptical in some context about why science or commerce are interested in certain of these skills. But insofar as it can attest to them and convinced people that have been made very skeptical about their own powers, I think that it corroborates the perennial philosophy, it corroborates the spiritual traditions, and it brings people back to that idea that you were talking about in the context of healing yourself, 
which I believe in fundamentally in relation to the power of consciousness, which is essentially what all mystics say, uh, that we have this great consciousness, we have it, we don't have to do anything more to get it, but we we should activate it, we should evolve, and it, it was from that process of actualization that a lot of ideas of human psychology, of self-actualization, Maslow, uh, Goldstein, um, came from they didn't they didn't spring out of, of of science itself they were informed by science but the idea of expansion is and growth and evolution is consistent with those traditions just a few days before i we release this particular video i think it's the prior video or maybe two before that gets released is with uh a, a very interesting entrepreneur and scientist, Rizwan Virk, who also went into great length talking about Philip K. Dick, and he emphasized the notion that Dick seemed to be convinced that there are parallel realities, alternative histories that are that are going on simultaneously to uh, the reality that we are experiencing, and that, and that he felt himself to somehow be traveling back and forth between these different realities uh, one thing I would emphasize but you can you can approach this from a physicalist or naturalist or scientific perspective and you can approach it from a mystical perspective or a magical perspective so uh, there's no doubt that he believed in that and he, he t uh, in some ways or he was open to that and he, he talked a lot about orthogonal time and the idea of a time which was at right angles to the m m normal movement of time and this would remind one of Bernard Carr and your discussions with Bernard Carr and but also remember the forgotten Be uh, Benjamin Blood who also wrote on the pluriverse uh, a, a, a good while ago so the, these uh, ideas are there but they they come to different results if you look at, if you take it from a magical perspective, and William Butler Yeats and his essay on magic in 1901, he believes that you can use symbols to access the great memory. It's, it's, so, so it's totally consistent with the idea that the mystics say that we can move beyond time and space, we can access different, different realities. Um, uh, he did say in, in in his talk in eighteen or nineteen seventy seven in Metz in, in France about that we're living in in a computer simu simulation, and that has been taken by many people to support an idea that it is a computer simulation. And I would I would disagree uh, with the emphasis by Bostrom and people like that to argue mathematically that we're living in a computer simulation. I uh, I, I don't agree with that, but. What I believe that that is, is a self-fulfilling prophecy as well, because I believe that within a generation, we will be living in a, a computer simulated environment. That's, that's the problem. So I believe that there is a, or there may be a certain self-perpetuating kind of, uh, same as Arthur C. Clarke, uh, almost propagandistic notion uh, about this. And also another person you have interviewed is Ben Goetzel, and he has done, I saw him doing a talk with another kind of android form of Philip K. Dick, and he seems to be very much into transhumanism. Now, I don't think that Philip K. Dick is arguing for transhumanism. I don't think, I, I, I'm, 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 my sense of him is that he is warning us against the, what is going to happen. He's saying, look, on this timeline, if you're following this path, your reason, technology, technology, this is what's going to happen. And this is the world that you are creating. Just just be aware of that. So he's not supporting it. In fact, all of his work, in my view, is deeply spiritual, deeply religious, coming from, uh, he's not coming from the right-hand path because he has great concerns with the failures of the religious institutions. And that's why he, he was friend with uh, Bishop Pike, who was who could have been tried for heresy, Bishop of San Francisco, Episcopalian, uh, and he wasn't engaged in a left-hand magical path. He was one of these figures, in my view, that charts a kind of middle zigzag path, uh, oscillating between various interpretations, with the objective of some kind of spiritual uh, evolution. Uh, so he he is he fits into that tradition for me that we could put in Blake 
and even going back to, to Burma. Now, the religious people who are not familiar with what Philip K. Dick has said will contest that. They uh, And I listened recently to uh, bishops in the Catholic Church and pastors in, uh, in the Presbyterian uh, Church uh, criticizing Gnosticism, for example. Uh, and I wasn't very impressed in, in either cases with the their, their understanding of the uh, what Gnosticism was or what it meant or what it may meant. And, and Philip K. Dick is often said to be Gnostic. He is in some sense, but again, there's a qualification because he believed he believed in God. He describes himself as a, a panentheist at one stage. Uh, he has a very complex idea of God, but it's it's very simple in many senses. It could go back to the Quaker idea of a direct connection with a supreme being and uh, it can't be it can't be dismissed he was a deeply spiritual man and he realized that the future uh, he had a message to 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 project to people uh, and he, he wasn't doing although his books i find them very funny in in many senses uh, and uh, compelling uh, the, the, he, he's not doing it for comic effect he's not doing it for mere fascination uh, he in fact Blade Runner was was, uh, was released just after or he died, and he had seen some early early uh, pre- preparatory films uh, of it, and, and he was very very happy. But he wouldn't change. He he did get offers to change some of his books to fit the films, and he didn't accept the the the, the money. Uh, he took a lesser sum because he didn't want to change his art. He was very. Uh, he was very rigorous in that sense. He was very noble uh, and had great integrity. Although he may have hung around with people that sold drugs at various stages and have uh, and, and used that for inspiration, he was uh, very noble in, in, in his adherence constantly to that quest for uh, understanding the nature of reality. And in my view, fundamentally committed to the idea that there is a divine source. Now, the divine source may come through Sirius or, or, or come through the star system, for example, or and Jesus may have actually been broadcast or had some connection with uh, or come from one of the uh, planets far away or one of one of the stars far away. So, so he allows for different interpretations of 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 uh, how things work, and, and just in that point. He, he he comes in a context of where some of your friends and some of the people you've interviewed, uh, like Robert Anton Wilson, uh, came from. Remember, well, of course you remember, you've talked to him. But, uh, Robert, uh, he talks about his experience with a sense of connection with, uh, w- w- with stars and, uh, and with n- a noetic sense of beams of beams that influence him, etc. Uh, and also uh, people like Terence McKenna. Um, the difference is, for me, is that whereas Robert Anton Wilson was agnostic and whereas people like Timothy Leary and McKenna believed in a god of science, actually, that when you look at uh, Timothy Leary really talked about technology being a god in, in the future and uh, McKenna seemed to be uh, in the same path, that uh, Philip K. Dick never left, for me, he never left that sense that there was a divine force and that we had divine consciousness. And if you open nearly any page in the Exegesis, which is a big book, he's talking about God, he's discussing God. So he's very theological and he should be considered as a serious, at least speculative theologian uh, in, in that sense. But he, he, he's coming from a different place than, than many others. Well, you've described P.K. Dick in our previous conversation as being akin to the biblical prophets. And uh, to my way of thinking, a, a prophet is not someone who predicts the future, but someone who says, if you don't change your ways, this is going to happen. And Gnostics are to my way of thinking, rather similar. What they're saying is is similar in the sense that they're they're pointing out that most people are worshiping a false god and are under the influence of a false god, not a true god. That's right uh, in relation to the Gnostics, but I would emphasize that if we're talking about Gnosticism in a, a, a narrow sense, properly defined, there is specific beliefs associated with that, which again are quite formalized and no matter what form it comes up when you're looking about Sophia and the origin and emanation they come to a very particular form uh, and 
many people would describe themselves as Gnostic, but not actually refer to that process. I, I, and there is a bit of confusion about the term because the Hans Jonas that wrote about Gnosticism, um, some of his descriptions of what Gnosticism means didn't doesn't fit with, for example, the Nag Hammadi, as far as I can understand. So uh, there is a bit of a, a different emphasis in relation to uh, what Gnosticism is, but certainly there is a similarity in relation to the Blake, the Blakean idea of projecting something onto the uh, onto the environment, which is literally uh, literally what technology is going to do. It's going to project things onto the environment. That that's what the the kind of idea is, and that was the similar t- thing in, in Blake, and that was the similar thing in relation to Gnosticism. I don't define him as Gnostic in a very narrow sense, which has that specific idea. Although he did refer to ideas of Sophia. In many ways, they were linked to his lost twin and that that obsession in, in many senses. But uh, the, the, there is a, uh, I, I think, his emphasis on Gnosis and the, the valuable idea of Gnosis is about the idea that it's experiential, that spirituality must be something you experience. And this is what the traditionalists on the right-hand path don't like. They want it to be about words, about control, about hierarchy, about systems, about dogma. And they have forgotten about the fact that spirituality, Christianity, uh, Jewish mysticism, whatever you want to pick, is and must be an experience. And the nature of the highest experience are beyond words. The words are only a sign. So when people are telling you exactly that this thing is, this this is the word of God, we have to bear in mind that your discussions about semantics, that they're capable of different interpretations. We have to rem- bear in mind what Swedenborg said, that there's a, there's a number of different texts. We have to bear in mind what the Jewish mystics said, that the, the written word and the literal interpretation is the darkest interpretation of the words. Uh, we have to bear in mind that they're translated from different languages, that they have different meanings, that they evolved over a period of time, that they're living documents, that prophecy didn't stop you know, uh, three and a half thousand years ago as people. It's funny that people that tell you about what the prophets say believe that they can't have, have any prophets today. We need we need people that can exercise some insight and from the whole range of context at least present hypothesis about what the optimum futures are. They don't have to be dogmatic. They don't have to beat people about the head, but they don't have to say this is absolute. They don't have to commit themselves to end of the world eschatology. They just have to present an insight that people can judge by themselves. And I think that's what the the type of prophecies that that, that we need for, uh, for the future that will be. And there's no doubt that this idea which I think is mysticism is better than uh, Gnosticism, in my view. I think mysticism is the, is the basis, is, is the idea that you experience and build on the experience yourself. You can interpret with great respect for the sacred texts, the range of them, and respect for other cultures, and you don't do it in an exclusive way. You don't use that book to beat someone else about the head with it. You persuade them, if you want to, about the superiority of your viewpoint, if you can. Uh, but we be open and we recognize that all of these things will be irrelevant if the nature of our very reality changes so that we can't engage in it. And the, when you have great imaginative, speculative thinking of someone like Philip K. Dick, uh, y- you at least get a key to a scenario that can happen, as you said, predicting where the timeline is going and where that that uh, ideas will lead us to, how they will crystallize, and looking into the crystal ball. It doesn't have to be like that, but it will be if we don't listen to some of the enlightened interpreters of, of reality. Once again, James Tunney, a very informative, uh, and I have to say, heartwarming discussion in the sense that you bring to bear uh, your wisdom and knowledge as a scholar, and at the same time, your vision as a mystic. I'm very grateful to be able to have these ongoing discussions with you and to be able to share them with our listeners and our viewers, James. Thank you once again so much 
for being with me. Uh, thank you very much, Jeffrey. And I'm sure we'll get uh, a lot of complaints. As, as, as Janelle says, complaint is a gift. But about all the all the books that we could have talked about, uh, the, there's so many uh, of his books that merit discussions, uh, and uh, we'll get around to, uh, again. But um, there's uh, there's a lot of interest and ideas there, and uh, I would encourage people that are not familiar with his work to begin to to, to look at. Uh, what he said to to come at it in their own terms. There's so much to choose from, not just the films, the the books themselves. To expose themselves to his writings or his criticisms, and to take seriously also for religious people that that wouldn't think of looking at science fiction. Uh, that that here you have a person that is talking about the things that they are talking about in their discussions, in their biblical uh, d- discussions as well, and. And look at them and reject them or, or, or whatever, but uh, bear them in mind and bring them into the discussion because we need to have a pluralistic uh, discussion for the for the pluriverse that we're we're entering. Thank you very much, Jeff. And for those of you listening or watching, thank you for being with us. <laughs> Thank you.